Welcome to the ICA Conference 20, 2021, Cooperation in a Fragmented World. My name is Odila Triebel. I'm Head of Dialogue and Research at IFA, the Institute for Foreign Cultural Relations in Germany. It is my great pleasure to chair the keynote today from the Kita Davan on Global Ethics and the Imperative to Save the Planet. For members of the audience who might be this morning new to the conference, please allow me to describe again the context shortly. This conference is the annual conference of the International Cultural Relations Research Alliance. This network set up in 2019 brings together international and scholarly institutions on the initiative of IFA in close collaboration with the British Council. ICRA sees itself as a bridge builder between practical cultural work, scholarly reflection, policy advice and the media. The goals of the network are the transfer of research-based knowledge in politics and society and the promotion of international knowledge exchange in cooperation in cultural relations. This year's topic, cooperation in a fragmented world, international cultural relations at the crossroads of climate, health and political crisis, focuses on the multiple global crises we are experiencing right now. We are looking thereby, therefore, have, excuse me, at specifically the intersections between these different global challenges, including the pandemic, climate change, debates around decoloniality. And we are asking how cultural relations can respond to these and help provide solutions. We are inviting perspectives from around the world to help to ask us what does good cultural relations look like under these current global circumstances. It is my great pleasure to welcome this morning Professor Nikita Davan, philosopher and a specialist on transnational justice and gendered vulnerability. Nikita Davan is Professor for Political Theory and Intellectual History at the TU Dresden in Germany. Previously, she holds positions as Professor of Gender Studies at the Justus Liebig University in Gießen, as well as in Innsbruck in Austria. She was director of the Frankfurt Research Center on Postcolonial Studies at the Excellence Cluster Normative Orders. She began her career by studying at the University of Mumbai in India, German Studies and Philosophy, and at the Women's University, Mumbai, University in Mumbai, Gender Studies, before re receiving her PhD at the Ruhr University in Bochum. Guest lectureships brought her all around the world, only to mention a few here. She, was, she taught in Bombay, in Costa Rica, am Institute for International Law and the Humanities at the University of Melbourne, Australia, in the program of critical theory at the University of California, Berkeley, at the University of Busan in South Korea, at the Whitewater Strand University, Johannesburg in South Africa, and last not least at the Columbia University in New York. Nikita Davan will speak today about transnational solidarity. Allow me to try to illustrate her thought style a little bit individually. She has, in my point of view, an extremely precise perception on the actual speaker position. Nikita Davan constantly considers not only what is being thought or spoken, but what actually is done. She has a sharp eye on what practices might be tried to hide by the use of certain discourses. Having one of her scholarly backgrounds in critical theory and being very familiar with Adorno and Horkheimer's work, not surprisingly, she often reveals not intended dialectical undercurrents. Allow me one final technical remark. With the registration, everybody has already declared her or his consent to the recording for publication and press or advertising purposes of this event. However, people should feel free to discuss openly because only the keynote lectures will be published in full length on the program site and the IFA YouTube channel. All discussions and discussion forums will also be recorded, however, not for the sake of publication in full length. We are planning to use only extracts and particular sequences from the discussion forums in order to produce a short highlight film in the aftermath. Professor Davan, thank you for being with us this morning. It is our great pleasure to host you at this convention. The floor is now yours. Thank you, dear Odila, for the kind uh, introduction and uh, to all the organizers for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here today. And uh, the title uh, of my um, talk today, as you can see on the screen, is Global Ethics and the Imperative 
to save the planet. In recent years, an increasing number of global citizens' movements have taken justice as their explicit goal. In contrast to those who, commit, who committed to go, uh, domestic justice, contribute to the well-being of their immediate communities and fellow citizens, theorists and activists in the field of transnational justice argue for a broader and deeper commitment that would encompass strangers both within and beyond state borders. They argue that in a globalized world, our duties and responsibilities are not limited to our fellow citizens. A concurrent effort emphasizes the economic, political, cultural, and sexual aspects of injustice. In the face of growing global interdependence, there's rising expectation that powerful actors, organizations, and nation states have an ethical responsibility towards the more vulnerable sections of the world population. The demand that transnational elites act beyond narrow territorial-based understanding of self-interest in order to protect victims of injustice seems convincing at first glance. However, given the long and violent history of colonial intervention in the non-Western world, current attempts to act in the interests of distant others often invoke suspicion and distrust. Euro-American supremacism and paternalism are reinstated once again with them acting as dispensers of rights and justice. The German sociologist Ulrich Peck points out that because we live in an increasingly interdependent world, we face common threats to our eco ecologies, finances, and security, so that violation of rights in one part of the world is felt everywhere. The globalization of risk, or what Beck calls the Weltrisikogesellschaft, unites us in our equal vulnerability, providing the basis for the cosmopolitan moment of a world risk society. In response to the question, how can the relationship <clears throat> between global risk and the creation of a global public be understood, Beck discusses a globalization of compassion, spectacularly demonstrated by the unprecedented readiness of citizens in faraway countries to donate to relief efforts. World Risk Society's shocking threats open up questions of social accountability and responsibility that cannot be adequately addressed either in terms of national politics or the available forms of international cooperation, according to Beck. The protagonists of international civil society become indispensable to the implementation of cosmopolitan values and initiators of a more just alter globalization. Now, although scholars of cosmopolitanism endorse global solidarity as a solution for past injustices and a promise for better times to come, I want to emphasize the complicities between liberal cosmopolitan articulations of solidarity and global structures of domination they claim to resist. <clears throat> I object to the project of cosmopolitanism because it fails to seriously address the historical processes through which certain individuals are placed in a situation from which they can aspire to global solidarity and universal benevolence. To their credit, global solidarity activists are trying to explore ways of improving people's lives. But in my view, that precisely is the problem. Their attempts to act in the interest of different, uh, distant others to look, look beyond their position to make everyone have as good a life as ours disregards the connection between the well-off here and the impoverished elsewhere. In contrast to the faith in cosmopolitanism's self-correctional reflexivity, the post-colonial feminist scholar Gayatri Spivak diagnoses in cosmopolitanism call to align ourselves with our fellow citizens, a shift from colonialism as the white man's burden, as Rudyard Kipling called it, to the burden of the fittest. The revision of social Darwinism divines, defines the unfit as either unable to help themselves or govern themselves. The distance between those who dispense justice, rights, aid, and solidarity, and those who are simply coded as victims of wrong, remains, uh, and thus as receivers, remains a signature of historical violence. 
Now, as I just pointed out, Beck proposes that our common vulnerability in the face of risk brings us together. But as we all know, we might be facing the same storm, but we are not all in the same boat. And that makes all the difference. So uh, the next folio, Bitta, the next slide, please. So in my talk, I'll focus the next uh, 30 minutes that I have, I'll focus on the role of the state, international civil society and the market when we are focusing on discussions about global, growing global inequality and calls for transnational justice. And um, on the one hand, um, as I just uh, outlined, one talks about the transnationalization of compassion. But on the other hand, one is also increasingly encountering what is called empathy fatigue. Um, and I here just, you know, would like to share a, a little uh, um, uh, quote where um, David Bryan says that, other, and it's, I'm just going to quote him, other people's problems, they overwhelm my mind. They say compassion is a vir virtue, but I don't have the time. And I think this is a wonderful, uh, it wonderfully encamp en encapsulates this uh, <clears throat> And this feeling of empathy fatigue that you can't help everybody and you feel overwhelmed by the problem. And there's a certain, um, there's a certain feeling of um, helplessness. And on the other hand, um, as we know, the Latin term compassus comes from, and the German term is also quite uh, instructive, um, comes from this idea that when somebody suffers, we suffer with them. Yeah? So that one suffers together. And uh, that global solidarity is the only antidote to neoliberalism, whereby a deep awareness of another suffering and desire to relieve another suffering gives rise to a world, um, uh, a world um, citizen, a global citizen, and a world society. Now, um, in light of these uh, considerations, the Sri Lankan feminist Malati De Alvis asks if we should be even allowed to witness the pain and suffering of other people if we are even truly capable of empathizing with the pain of other people if this only if this witnessing only serves to affirm our humanity and our capacity to care correspondingly of course we need to find authentic victims who truly deserve our solidarity and what do we do with our will to empower the disenfranchised and the vulnerable, and how do we deal with those who refuse to be interpolated as appropriate objects of our benevolence? Um, now, in light of this theoretical framing on these you know, ideas, these norms of global citizenship and cosmopolitanism, I'd like to uh, illustrate my arguments and my critique with two concrete recent examples to show the limits of ideas of transnational cooperation and global solidarity. So, uh, and also this imperative to save the planet. So, um, COVAX, COVID-19 COVID Vaccines Global Access is a worldwide initiative aimed at equitable access to COVID-9 vaccines directed by Gavi, Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. The Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, CP, and the World Health Organization, WHO, under the slogan, uh, the next folio, Bitter, the next slide, please. With a fast moving pandemic, no one is safe unless everyone is safe, end of quote. COVAX coordinates international resources to enable low to middle income countries equitable access to COVID-19 tests, therapies, and vaccines. By 15 July, 2020, 165 countries representing 60% of the human population had joined COVAX. COVAX is principally funded by Western countries, although mainly funded by governments. Uh, the COVAX scheme is also receiving funds from private sector and philanthropic country contributions, including the Gates Foundation, Gates Foundation. The next slide, please. Now, there was hope that the immense, immensity of the uh, pandemic would override a global drug system based on propriety science and market monopolies. There was talk of shared interests and in global uh, public goods. Drug companies pledged no profit approaches to develop uh, and pricing of the vaccines. 
India and South Africa, who've been leading a group of about 60 countries at the World Health, uh, well, World Trade Organization, pushed for the temporary removal of intellectual property protections on vaccines. Next slide, please. Promises of open science and cooperative pandemic response were outmatched by the power of those dedicated to monopoly medicine pursuing an intellectual property-based charity agenda. So instead of promoting sharing of know-how and tech transfer, powerful actors like Bill Gates promoted drug companies' right to exclusive control over medical science and the, market, and the markets for its products. The role of intellectual property, IR, is touted in driving biomedical innovation, and it is argued that anything that inhibits industry profits will undermine research and development. The rationale was to prevent poor nations to free ride on Western science and build parallel drug economies. It was further argued that IPR protects profits that are then used for development of new drugs in the future. Unsurprisingly, drug companies supported COVAX enthusiastically. Pfizer CEO Albert Burula openly denounced the pooling of intellectual property as dangerous and nonsense. Next slide, please. So interestingly, the White House backed the TRIPS, a trade-related intellectual property rights waiver, despite intense opposition from the pharmaceutical industry the Gates Foundation, and even Bill Gates himself. A waiver would allow member nations to stop enforcing a set of COVID-19 related patents for the duration of the pandemic so that low and middle income countries could produce or import generic versions of vaccines. After strong criticism, the Gates Foundation reversed course on COVID-19 vaccine patents and announced that the foundation is supportive of temporarily lifting corona vaccine patent protections. However, Germany continues to strongly reject the proposal to waive patents on COVID-19 vaccine, saying that they were not hindering production of the jabs. Next slide, please. So on the one hand, um, Germany celebrating diversity. The new face of Germany is the dream team uh, which uh, developed the breakthrough COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccine with Pfizer. And on the other hand, next slide, please. The German government stated, and I quote them, the protection of intellectual property is a source of innovation and must remain so, end of quote. Interestingly, the European Union earlier said that it was ready to talk about the proposal and some states such as France and Italy gave their full backing uh, when it came to waiving the uh, COVID pa patents, but uh, Germany refused um, uh, to play along and, uh, like I said, continues to veto any kind of open access to COVID-19 patents. In the context of talks about, uh, right now in Germany, there's a lot of discussion around reparations, about reconciliations. So in, con in the context of talks about reparations, vaccine nationalism or vaccine apartheid as the journal Spiegel puts it, it is very instructive to uh, note that on the same day that it was announced that uh, Germany apologized for colonial acts of terror and would return the Benin bronzes. So this is the whole debate around the Humboldt Forum. On the same day, it was also announced that Germany would start vaccinating children over 12. Given that most doctors and health workers on the African continent have not even received the first vaccination. At this point, cosmopolitanism and Welt often height. Um, one, one sees how proclamations, the cynicism of proclamations of global solidarity, cosmopolitanism, and Welt often height. The impact of colonialism goes beyond the racism that minorities have to live with in a white world. Black Lives Matter movement is, of course, extremely important, but those who do not speak from first world platforms do not have the same opportunities to be heard as minorities in the West. So uh, to give another uh, example, the murder of climate activists in countries like Colombia, Brazil, and the Philippines in recent years has been unprecedented. And yet 
when we think of current ecological movement, we think of first world activists for Fridays, uh, of Fridays for Future. So um, my conclusion of my first section, before I move on to the second section, and I'm sorry, it's a slightly provocative, uh, the next slide, please, is, um, and here again, I'm drawing on Gayatri Spiva, that unfortunately, regrettably, we live in a world where the rapists are in charge of the rape kit. So those who are the biggest violators of uh, ideas of equality, freedom, solidarity, are the ones who are constantly proclaiming these norms, which is why it's my claim. Um, so this is uh, to do a little bit of self-marketing of my next book. Um, I've just finished uh, my, the manuscript and the book is titled Rescuing the Enlightenment from the Europeans, Critical Theories of Decolonization. Because in, there's, there's this stereotype that post-colonial scholars are anti-enlightenment. And my argument is actually all the Europeans talk about equality, uh, solidarity, cosmopolitanism, um, secularism, uh, rule of law, constitutionalism, global justice, human rights, democracy, all these wonderful legacies of European enlightenment, they're also the biggest violators of European enlightenment. Okay, this brings me to the next um, part uh, of my talk and then I'll move to the conclusion. Um, and here I'm going to focus on one particular actor when we're talking about global cooperation. So there's the market, and I've already shown the role of the, the extremely pernicious role of the market. There are international civil society actors. And the third, of course, big player is the state. So this section is called the death of Leviathan. Uh, against the claim that a common vulnerability, vulnerability brings us together, I would counter argue that deep asymmetries of power and wealth cannot be corrected simply by articulations of transnational solidarity. Civil society as well as social movements are marked by hierarchies and exclusions that are disturbingly overlooked in celebratory discourses about their opposition to the state. So this actually comes, uh, this idea actually comes from Hegel, where he kind of makes a distinction between the evil state and the good civil society. And this is, of course, taken up by Marxists and anarchists and feminists and also post-colonial scholars. But it's my, my concern is that the staging of the state as an agent of terror and civil society as an agent of salvation can have vicious neocolonial and imperialistic consequences, particularly for extremely vulnerable subaltern groups in the global south. Transnational civil society and counter publics tend to empower civil society actors whose will to do good and will to resist is marked by feudality and enabled by a neoliberal framing. So it's my plaidoyer that it's imperative to ask whether enthusiastic discourses of resistance are empowering for disenfranchised communities or they simply reinforce relations of domination between those who act and those on whose behalf these colorful, lively, uh, discourses of social movements and resistance are being staged. Given the state monopoly on violence, its patriarchal, racist, imperialist proclivities, the question, of course, is should feminists, queers, religious, and racial minorities be wary of engaging with the state and devote their progressive political labor to extra state initiatives? Of course, the the anxieties about states coercive powers are extremely legitimate. But at the same time, my question is, can the state be interpolated as a site of redress? Can one use the coercive powers of the state for progressive politics? Or should one focus on the art of not being governed as commented by the anthropologist, the anarchist anthropologist, James Scott, who proposes that state evasion, that you know, getting out of the power of the state is a survival strategy for many vulnerable classes. Now, in my view, progressive political projects are caught in a double bind vis-a-vis -vis the state and its coercive powers. So let me once again give you all a couple of examples um, of what are the risks of disregarding the enabling role of the state, particularly and also the consequences of anti-statism, particularly for disenfranchised groups. So instead of an ideal theory of the state, I'm not just saying that, you know, oh, look, 
Germany is a functioning welfare state or Canada is a fantastic example of a well functioning uh, well uh, uh, you know state or New Zealand what I'm going to uh, what I'm my effort is to rethink our relationship to the state and the impossibility of taking any simple for or against positions vis-a-vis -vis the state so um, I will now I'm going to give you my punchline already so my argument is that the state is like a pharmacon. Uh, uh, it's a very, very interesting Greek concept, which means it can be both poison and also medicine, counter poison. And um, I'll show you all a couple of examples um, to illustrate what I mean when I talk about why uh, it's very important not to just, you know, um, place radical politics and progressive politics in the realm of non-state, uh, in the non-state realm and um, make non-state actors as vanguards of uh, transnational justice and uh, global solidarity. So the next slide, please. Um, now, uh, what has happened in the past years, and this is one of the effects of uh, neoliberalism, uh, there's been a systematic dismantling of the accountability of the state towards its most vulnerable citizens and which has which has resulted in the state more and more withdrawing from accountability and an erosion of also state sovereignty and this is one of the results of transnationalization of capital but also transnationalization of cooperation international cooperation so the state has somehow taken a back seat when it comes to questions of uh, uh, of uh, in international cooperation and this like I point out, can be both good and bad. So um, the next slide, please. To come back to, um, no, sorry, before I uh, get to the next slide. So on the one hand, um, there has been a very, very strong rise in what is called biopolitics. So how modern states mobilize medicine and biology to govern bodies and how risks are being managed through surveillance and state regulations with promise of ensuring security of the population by exerting power over life and death. And this is what Michel Foucault, the French philosopher, when he talks about biopower and biopolitics, he talks about the right of the sovereign state to kill with impunity. So Ashil Bembe, the um, Cameroonian uh, political scholar, political scientist, talks about necropolitics, how the state um, abolishes protections and guarantees like laws, rights, freedom, responsibility in order to be able to kill. Now, I find what Foucault and Bembe say quite convincing and compelling. So this idea that the state monopolizes, uh, uh, the state's monopoly on violence somehow um, makes a necropolitics po possible at the same time. And so this is the double move I make. This is only one side of the story. Um, so yes, the state can be poisoned, the state can be violent, the state can be exploitative, but at the same time, I also argue that the state, uh, and these are the ambivalences, these are the slippages, these are the inconsistencies of the state. The state can also function as an enabling, um, as a site of redress, as a location of, um, uh, of uh, uh, protection and promotion of norms of equality and uh, justice. So the Cambridge economist Joanne Robertson once famously said that the misery of, of being exploited by capitalism or capitalists is nothing compared to the misery of not being exploited at all. And along similar lines, I would argue that the danger of the genocidal state is parallel to that of the missing state. And what do I mean by that? Now, let me give you the examples. The next slide, please. So on the one hand, uh, we saw a very, very, very strong anti-restriction protests uh, during COVID. So one of the most uh, acute uh, examples of this is the storming of the German parliament. The next slide, please, which happened in, the, uh, in August, uh, late August uh, 2020 in Berlin. So this is one uh, example of where citizens were very concerned that the state was overreaching um, um, its uh, powers 
and restricting and regulating the rights of its uh, citizens. And on the other hand, so this is one example. On the other hand, next slide, please. Um, let me give you an example from May 2021 uh, from India, where Outlook, which is one, one of the um, critical journals in India, brought out its uh, uh, issue um, with, the, with the title Lapata, missing. And uh, it said, what is missing? The government of India, age seven years. In, and then if you find this entity, please inform the citizens of India. And the reason for coming up with this cover was, the next slide please, that in all of April and May, there was images of bodies floating in the river Ganga, which was circulating globally, and are evidence of what happens when the state not only fails in its most basic function of protecting the, the lives of its citizens, but also of granting some basic dignity in death. So while the living could not be heard in India, the death could not be silenced. So as you all know, there was a surge of the Delta variant, which started around, the, uh, around March. And already uh, uh, in February, uh, the pr prime minister had declared that India had overcome COVID and was exporting vaccines to all parts of the world. Um, restrictions had been uh, rolled back. There were huge political rallies being held. There were huge religious rallies being held. Um, and then suddenly the Delta surge happened and the state could not cope. Uh, the next slide, please. And one of the uh, campaigns um, that one saw on the streets of Delhi was, uh, of the missing state was, uh, posters that were put up criticizing the government saying, Modiji, why did you send our children's vaccines abroad? And uh, the protesters were arrested by the government. The next slide, please. Um, India is considered to be the biggest vaccine producer in the world. But these are the kinds of posters you saw in March, April, May, all over the country that set up jumbo vaccine centers and everywhere there was absolutely no vaccine available. So while in Europe and in other parts of the world, um, uh, vaccination was going on in, you know, uh, there was a race to vaccine citizens in India, although it was one of the, it is one of the biggest producers of vaccines in the world, there were no vaccines available because the vaccines had been sent for export or there were none being produced because the argument was that vaccine, that uh, COVID is already over in India. The next slide, please. So the leader of the national states uh, National Students Union of India filed a missing person report with the Delhi police saying that the state had run away during the COVID crisis. And he said that he wanted to make sure that in a few years, people don't forget how the state had got missing in India. The next slide, please. Um, now, usually when we think about anti-state politics or the critique of the state, we think about left. The left, we think about anarchist, Marxist, feminist, uh, progressive politics. It is interesting to note that um, anti state politics very often also comes from neoliberal and right wing uh, uh, sources. So, here I have a quote by uh, two quotes actually one by Ronald Reagan, who says, Government is not the solution to our problem, government is the problem. And the next one comes from uh, Steve Bannon, the mastermind behind Trump's nationalist ideology and the former executive chairman of Breitbart News, a platform for the alt-right to champion their racist, anti-Semitic and sexist points of view. And he said that the goal, so he was asked what was the Trump doctrine, and he said that the goal was the unending battle for the deconstruction of the administrative state. I think this is extremely instructive uh, as an illustration of what Michel Foucault calls state phobia. So how um, there is a deep, deep distrust of the state. There is a certain demonization of the state and this kind of demonization of the state, this kind of lack of trust in the state actually has very, very negative consequences for extremely vulnerable populations and groups in the global south. The next slide, please. 
Now, I want to, this is the last example, and then I'll move to my conclusion. So I'm doing quite okay in terms of time. Now, uh, when I talk about state phobia, when I talk about states monopoly on violence, um, for me personally, one of the best examples of the dangers of state phobia is um, um, Nazi Germany. And here I take uh, inspiration from the historian Timothy Snyder, uh, who in his book, Black Earth, the Holocaust as History and Warning, talks about the ambivalent nature of the state. And he shows how during the National Socialist regime, when the Nazis systematically destroyed one state after another, the, the Jewish population and other vulnerable groups became so too, and they were stripped of citizenship because when there is no state, there is no citizenship. How they were, how it became possible to kill vulnerable citizens because the protection of the state was taken away. So now let me go through a couple of examples and then I'll move to my conclusion. When Germany destroyed Austria in 1938, conditions were created that made the extermination of Austrian Jews possible. Timothy Snyder analyzes the images of Jews forced to scrub the streets of Vienna and wash away the word Österreich, Austrian Jews were being made to unwrite the name of the state of which they had been citizens. The next slide, please. So this is the famous slide of Austrian Jews being made to scrub away the word Österreich from the streets of Vienna. Next slide, please. Similarly, when Czechoslovakia was destroyed in 1939, Jews suffered a level of persecution not possible in Germany. When Germany invaded Poland in 1939 and destroyed legal and social structures, the persecution of Polish Jews was taken to a new level. Another compelling example Snyder gives is of the survival rates of Jews in countries where the state was not destroyed. In Denmark, for instance, 99% of Jews who had Danish citizenship survived, unlike Jewish refugees who were denied state protection. In Estonia, 99% of Jews were killed, not because, and this is an extremely important point, it's not that the Danes were less anti-Semitic than Slavs and Baltic peoples, but because institutional frameworks and connections to the sovereign state obstructed the implementation of the final solution. Next slide, please. Similarly, the survival rate of French Jews was higher than that of Greek and Dutch Jews. And despite France having a bigger problem with anti-Semitism, 75% of French Jews survived, whereas 75% of Dutch Jews were killed. In Greece, German-style anti-Semitism almost had no advocates so Snyder, and these are all examples from Snyder's book, argues that when the state was destroyed entirely or sovereignty compromised or changed hands, Jews were killed. Drawing on Hannah Arendt, um, Snyder interprets these statistics and concludes that the first steps towards the mass extermination of the Jews during National Socialism was to render them stateless, to take away the citizenship. So, you know, when one says Germans kill the Jews, this is such a problematic statement because it implies that Jews were not Germans. And by taking away the protections of citizenship, it was possible by stripping away the legal uh, status of Jews as German citizens it was possible to kill them. So destroying the state was inextricably linked to the killing of the juridical person by which one takes away the protection of law enabling the regime to more easily kill the person. So here, of course, uh, Hannah Arendt is extremely important. Her insights are extremely important. The next slide, please. Snyder wants, so this is Snyder's critique against anarchist theories where they say, you know, if you just, take away the state, you do away with the state and we live in some kind of harmonic tabula rasa and then you know we can have uh, uh, non-violent harmonic 
interpersonal relations uh, from which freedom and democracy can grow, uh, Snyder argues that if one understands the Holocaust only in terms of an authoritarian, fascist, uh, uh, biopolitical, necropolitical German state, then of course one comes to the conclusion one has to destroy authoritarianism. However, if one understands the rule under the Nazis as a special kind of racial regime in which ideology and practice obliviated the remnants of states, then the destruction of the state, the erosion of the state is directly related to the Holocaust. So now comes the, uh, the uh, uh, punchline. What, what I've, I've been trying to say in the last 35 minutes is that the counterintuitive historical lesson that this book teaches us is that bureaucracies, passports, paperwork, can actually save lives. Let me give you one more concrete uh, uh, recent example, not just a historical example, but a more recent example. The next slide, please. And this example comes from UK. So we all know about the Grenfell Towers uh, uh, fires in London and uh, how neoliberalism promises that a bonfire of red tape liberates the economy. And we all know that sometimes red tape health and safety regulations can also save lives. So let me move to my conclusion. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, already Foucault, uh, so it's interesting on the one hand, Michel Foucault talks about uh, necro, uh, he talks about, sorry, biopolitics and biopower and talks about how, you know, here he's uh, very inspired by the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who uh, describes the state as a monstre frua, the coldest of all cold monsters. And at the same time, Michel Foucault says that we have to be very careful not to demonize the state. We have to dismantle the mythology and monstrosity of the Leviathan and rather be very careful of dangers of state phobia, of rejecting the state, of saying, you know, the state, um, uh, this, the deep distrust vis-a-vis -vis the state, um, in a certain way empires, empowers sorry, transnational elites and takes away the protections from um, uh, uh, vulnerable subaltern groups. So uh, what Foucault does is he tries to show how complex the state is, that the state is not just you know, a, a static entity, rather, and I like the uh, definition that he gives, that the, st the state is a mobile effect of multiple regimes, uh, uh, mobile uh, effect of a regime of multiple governmentalities, which is full of contradictions, inconsistencies, slippages, ambivalences. So the state at once exists, but not, does not exist enough. The next slide, please. So I'd like to end with the joke that we have in India, that uh, the only pleasure the Indians take uh, in exercising, great pleasure in exercising is the right to criti criticize the government. Everything else is considered a colonial hangover. So in this spirit, I would argue that when we are talking about uh, currently problems, whether it's economic problems, uh, crisis, ecological crisis, um, uh, health crisis, um, we have to pursue a very rigorous, very robust critique of the state without falling into the trap of state phobia in post-pandemic times. So I would once again emphasize the state is like pharmacon. It's both poison and medicine. The challenge, of course, is how to convert poison into medicine. So the next slide, please. I just found uh, this wonderful uh, uh, image uh, which says, Krupaya hon na bajaye, Modi sarkar so rahi hai. So please do not honk. The Modi government is sleeping. And this is a very good example of a critique of a state. At the same time, the citizen does not reject the state, does not, uh, uh, the uh, state as a very important actor of uh, upholding and promoting uh, the rights of citizens. And I think the, the biggest challenge lies in holding the state accountable, in making sure that. Um, that the state 
serves, and I'm using my, I'm, I'm, I'm choosing my words very carefully, that the state serves its most vulnerable citizens and not just the transnational elite. I'd like to uh, just a couple of more minutes. Um, so I'll, I'm going to move away. So that was the second part uh, where I focused on the state. The first part was on, you know, transnational uh, justice movement and the role of international civil society actors and the market. Um, in the second part, I focused on the state. And in the, in the conclusion, I'd like to focus on two extremely inspiring and important German words, Vergangenheitsbewältigung uh, and Zukunftsfähigkeit. So uh, the former word can be roughly translated as working through the past. And the latter word implies future viability. I'm just going to repeat the words, Vergangenheitsbewältigung, working through the past, and Zukunftsfähigkeit, future viability. Now, my first language is Hindi. And uh, it's interesting to note that in Hindi, the word for yesterday is the same as the word for tomorrow, kal. So when you say, talk about yesterday, you use the word kal. And when you talk about tomorrow, you also use the word kal. And Salman Rushdie jokes, and I quote him, no people whose word for yesterday is the same as their word for tomorrow can be said to have a firm grip on the time, end of quote. Now, to the contrary, I would argue that in order to be tsukumspeish, in order to be able to think about, you know, imagine, be, be a utopist, uh, to have hopes for the future, one has to be able to undertake the Gagan Heights which involves taking stock of how the world, and this is something I started with, and I thought it's only logical that I end with this point. We have to reflect. We have to scrutinize. We need to think about how we reach this point where the world is divided into those who help, those who resist, those who show solidarity, who dispense rights and justice, and those so the world is divided into two. I'm not talking about black and white. I'm not talking about global north, global south, uh, Christians and Muslims, uh, straight and queer. Um, all these categories are of course important. But for me, the most decisive category is where the world is divided into those who govern, those who help, those who dispense justice, rights, aid, solidarity, and those who are acted upon those who are at the receiving end, who passively are coded as simply the victims of global inequality and whose rights, whose, uh, who, you know, the, where the wrongs have to be righted. And um, on the one hand, we live in a world where we are experiencing unprecedented advance in science and technology, rapid social and political transformation, which promises the protection and promotion of equality and freedom globally. But we are also facing unparalleled challenges and uh, uh, a re kind of configuration and realignment of agency globally. And although we seem to be headed towards planetary destruction and ruin, we are also the cusp of unimaginable global movements that are struggling for economic, political, social, and cultural justice. And my last statement for, from, uh, of my talk. And then I look forward to the Q&A is that I would argue that our histories of the past should be strategic interrogations of the present as a way of enabling imaginaries for post-imperialist futures. Thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Odila, uh, we can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I do. Thank you very much for your for your uh, for your talk and um, for your reflections. And um, I think I, I see my part only in bridging the time for the audience to to grasp um, their, their questions. And so I I would like to just take the chance for a short, uh, not response but remarks and in the contextualizations to the to the previous talks um, we we had the chance to to hear uh, on Wednesday and uh, and Monday. So one 
question that is, resonates a little bit with, with uh, what um, Walter Mendiolo's remarks. And as you just mentioned it, your first mo your mother tongue actually in first language has been Hindi, and you you gave a wonderful example of how the the language provides a, a different epistemology. Um, um, my question is. Um, how how did it happen or what is your stance and, and it is really in resonance to what Mendiolo said why are you using the the european um, epistemology in in for your thoughts and and for your analysis of the pharmacon and see maybe the, U the european epistemology as a pharmacon itself but mm. uh, but not looking uh, in, in in different epistemologies for so solutions. So this is this is uh, one one of the questions. The other one is uh, it's it's wonderful that you also very much put the the state and the the understanding of the state, uh, the concept of the state in the in the center of your your talk. And this also resonates to the other other lectures we heard. And to put it a little bit. Yeah, Walter Mediolo, he made a very, very crucial point that the the idea of the state, we this is dominant nowadays in the the global world, is is really one also linked to a certain type of epistemology and 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 history, and uh, the 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 borders and the governance structures um, are are not not in very very often in the world uh, um, actually built up from the from the bottom by the by the self governance of of the people but from 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 above and the people still suffering from from these these uh, legacies of the of the past so um and and uh, and um obi ezek vizili she claimed that that yeah, that that what what is needed is to have what she called a, a bigger tent over the existing institutions. So so I heard it as a as um, as a, the pledge for for combining adding to to the existing institutions, but something like transnational civic societies. And and we do have example of this. That actually this this some some parts group of of a kind of transnational civic society actually could push even legal frameworks uh, further and could uh, di direct governments into into further action for example in germany we have this example and actually by by active this the, the the state was 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 needed to acknowledge that actually the future generation do have a, have a, have a rights um so yeah, so my question goes in this direction. I heard a little bit more that you accentuate it before before go transnational, make sure that your own state is accountability. <laughs> so maybe I, I I'm a little um um overdoing it in order to so, so to post to to the other other lectures, but um I would like to to respond to this to um uh, yeah if, if this is a little bit the direction you go you go to. And Thank you. Um, yeah. finally, my my mm. question is um, about about your own positionality. So, do mm. you have a certain ad address you have a particular in mind with your talk? So, is it a little bit more? Uh, yeah, is is there a, a, a top a certain not not a topography, but are there certain audience you are particularly addressing, or do you see that? Um, you you refer actually to something that is already in transnational intellectual discourse. Mm. Thank you, Adila. Fantastic questions. Really, really good questions. Um, I'll try and do justice to them. So right right at the beginning, just in case people are confused, I have a very different position to Walter Mignolo. Um, so let me start with the first question about uh, European epistemology as pharmacon. Yes, I would agree to that that yes, European epistemology can be both poison and medicine. And we know during colonialism, colonialism was also a form of universalization of um, specific European ideas, um, which were universalized through colonialism, which is why Deepesh Chakravarti in his book, Provincializing Europe, argues that decolonization is linked to de-universalization of European epistemology. But what is interesting to note is that Deepesh Chakravarti also argues that um, provincializing Europe is necessary, but also impossible. And now I will explain why uh, my position is different to Mignolo's, because Mignolo um, argues that uh, his understanding of decolonization is epistemic delinking, that in a certain way, modernity cannot be rescued, that modernity is so contaminated um, 
that there is such a deep relation between colonialism and European modernity and European epistemologies that the only way forward, um, uh, that the only formula for decolonization is a return to pre-colonial indigenous epistemologies, cosmologies, and ethics. And it sounds like a very compelling idea. And I know that a lot of young students particularly are very enthusiastic about this you know, radical return to pre-colonial um, um, and also a certain romanticization of indigenous groups and uh, their uh, epistemologies and cosmologies. And I remember as a young student myself, I also was very enthusiastic about this kind of formula for decolonization. Um, thankfully, I have grown up and I've understood that um, what uh, post-colonial scholars like Gayatri Spivak and Deepesh Chakravarti are pointing towards is how deeply entangled the, and this is one of the, uh, what, one of the impacts of colonialism, the Western and non-Western epistemologies, materialities are. So um, I'm going to, sorry, Odila, I'm going to give a longer answer because you've raised such sure, important sure. questions. So, um, you know, um, when my former colleague, Jürgen Habermas, the German philosopher, uh, talked about, uh, in his book, talked about the emergence of enlightenment in Europe and gave the example of coffee houses where bourgeois men, of course, they were bourgeois men, who came together to uh, deliberate over current issues like the French Revolution and if it's, uh, um, uh, you know, okay if the ends justify the means and it is okay to deploy violence towards just means. Um, and they were sitting in these coffee houses, drinking coffee, smoking cigarettes, uh, and, um, uh, and Habermas talks about these coffee houses as the birthplace of European enlightenment and deliberative democracy. My question, of course, is where did the coffee come from? <laughs> where did the sugar in the coffee come from? Where did the tobacco come from? Who financed the enlightenment? And uh, so here I quote uh, Franz Fanon, who says, Europe is literally a product of its colonies. Uh, and these are the material entanglements between uh, Europe and the non-European world. Now, to give you a perspective from the other side of the world, um, Mignolo argues that we should all learn Quechua and Aymara. We should learn indigenous languages. Um, and that's the path to decolonization. Now, my counter argument or what I'd like to re remind Mignolo is we would not have access to Quechua and Aymara without the Jesuit priests because these were oral traditions and it was the Jesuit priests who codified these languages, wrote the grammar now, so that our access to Quechua and Aymara today is mediated through the Jesuit priests. You introduced, when you introduced me, you pointed out that I studied in Bombay. I had a very rigorous training in Indian, ancient Indian philosophy. We are talking about pre-colonial -pre philosophy, um, Indian philosophy. When I learned Sanskrit, when I learned Pali, um, when I go to the Bombay University Library and there are the entire Vedas and Upanishads and all the sutras and shastras, these have all been translated for the East India Company by the uh, German philologist and Sanskritist Friedrich Max Müller. So my access to Sanskrit, to Pali, which were also oral traditions, is mediated through a German Sanskritist who never set a foot in India. He was never in India and till date is considered one of the greatest Sanskritists in the world. So there are no uncontaminated tools. There is no uncontaminated access to pre-colonial epistemologies. So in an uh, article, again, to do a bit of self-marketing, um, I uh, the, uh, the title of my article is Can Non-Europeans Philosophize? And I argue that there is a certain danger in this romanticization of non-Western perspectives and epistemologies. Because what, what then happens is you reduce people like me to native informants. So when I'm invited to give a talk like that, you will say, oh, but why is she talking about Kant and Foucault and Derrida and uh, 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 Nussbaum and Beck? Why isn't she you know, uh, giving us examples from India? And I'm happy to do that. I did give you a couple of examples, but I think there is a certain problem in 
uh, in a kind of a, a, a nativization of knowledge, because that in a certain way disregards these very, very deep entanglements. Um, and here I'm drawing inspiration actually from Franz Fanon and his critique of negritude and Pan-Africanism. So he was showing that there is a certain, and I'm thinking for now together with Gayatri Spivak, there is a certain repetition in reversal. So by saying, okay, we were forced to adopt European epistemology during colonialism, decolonization is to reject everything European. And then you'll end up, I'm being a bit, bit provocative, you'll end up with Boko Haram, who, you know, close schools and who deny access to education to young girls by saying, that um, West is, uh, everything West is evil and we reject it. I mean, again, to give you another concrete example, homosexuality in India was criminalized during British colonial rule, Section 377, Unnatural Sexual Practices Act. Um, some years back, uh, NGO uh, 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 went to the Delhi court to overturn Section 377 and argued that, you know, see, this was a colonial law. And um, even in, in, in UK, Section 377 has been overturned. And then the judge said, oh, but we are free. We don't have to do what the Britishers do. So here you, you have this very perverse situation that a colonial law is then defended as Indian tradition, whereby it was argued that actually there was no homosexuality in India and that the colonizers brought homosexuality to India. So I think that we have to be very, very careful. Uh, and this would be my uh, response to the only the first question that you raised. Um, uh, this idea of Mignolo about epistemic delinking, that as if we can neatly compartmentalize our lives and uh, you know say, oh, now today, I'm only going to focus on non-Western epistemologies. And that Western epistemologies are contaminated and that I don't want to have anything to do with it. So I, um, to wrap up this part of my response, um, I would revisit. So there's this famous line by the black uh, lesbian uh, feminist scholar, uh, Audre Lord, who says, you cannot use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. And Gayatri Spivak talks about an affirmative sabotage. She says, how, what do we do with the legacies of European enlightenment? and how we can take these tools that we have inherited from the entire enlightenment towards uh, our goal to decolonize the world and towards a most, more post-imperialist future. Yeah? So this is an open question. Um, now to come to the question of uh, the state and um, if uh, the antidote to nationalism and uh, on the one hand, and to globalization on the other hand, are you know transnational structures, which in a certain way would uh, um, would rectify the failures of the state. And here um, I'm going to give again a slightly long answer. So first of all, what I've tried to do in my talk and in my work, which goes beyond just today's talk, is to show how transnational civil society is class biased. That there is a certain element of elitism in transnational civil society. That uh, most actors in the transnational sphere are actors who already have access to the enabling mechanisms of the state. Even, and I'm not just talking about people like me, you know, I'm, I'm a part of a very small, privileged uh, group, only 8%, 10% of Indians speak English. So that already tells you everything about my class. But also institutionalized civil society actors have already access to global capital. And this cannot be said about subaltern groups. So um, to give again a historical example, Edward Said in Orientalism uh, talks about how, and he gives the example of India, how um, a country of 300 million people was ruled by just 4,000 administrators, 60,000 
soldiers and 90,000 civilians for 350 years. And this was only possible because native elites were complicit in colonialism. They profited from colonialism. And this also, this historical example is also relevant when we talk about current global structures. There are native elites from the global south who are complicit in neoliberal politics today and neoliberal structures today, which is why I speak about the tragedy of decolonization. For, for the majority of people in the world, I mean, of course, there's been a formal transfer of power from European uh, colonizers to native elites, but for the majority of people in the world with lack of access to food sovereignty, primary healthcare facility, basic education, um, the decolonization actually principally never happened. There is a certain continuity of neocolonial structures. And then the question remains, how can the relationship, the dynamic between different actors be reconfigured to enable access for subaltern groups to both civil society, international civil society, and the state. Now comes the last point that I want to address. Um, what is the state? When we talk about the state, because we are talking about international civil society being removed from the state, here I'd like to draw on the Marxist uh, um, state scholar, Bob Jessup. So Bob Jessup gives us a wonderful, uh, he shares a wonderful anecdote that he was on the way to a conference and he realized that the person sitting next to him was also going to the same conference. So he turned around and introduced himself and said, hello, my name is Bob Jessup and I'm a state theorist and we seem to be going to the same conference. And the person next to him turned around and said, I'm Nicholas Luhmann and the state does not exist. And Bob Jessup says that this statement of Nicholas Luhmann um, was like kind of a crisis for him because he of course understood himself as a state theorist and Nicholas Luhmann said, but the state does not exist. And he says, what is Luhmann trying to say when he says the state is, does not exist? Is he saying that it does not exist enough, that it has to still be constructed? Or is he trying to say that we have to you know, do away with the state, the Marxist utopia of withering away of the state? And Bob Jessup argues that one of the most difficult questions for a state theorist is the, the question that gives us sleepless nights is what is a state? And this is what I was trying to show, that the state is extremely contradictory, extremely ambivalent, extremely inconsistent. I, for example, am, I'm not a German citizen but I'm a German civil servant. Ich bin auf Lebenszeit. Yeah, so without being a German citizen, I am, I have a civil servant status. I work for the German state and have a permanent contract with the German state. So I, I had, I just recently changed my job and I had to take an oath to uphold the German constitution. So actually, I'm not outside the state. My, I get my salary from the German state. IFA is funded by the German state. We are not, not, I mean, I am of course also a civil society actor, but I'm also part of the state. And this is where the boundaries of state and non-state gets blurred. So very often, I mean, um, and I'll, I'll wrap up because I'm sure there are many, many other interesting questions. Um, some of the most important interlocutors, you know, when I started thinking about the question of the state, um, were my anarchist students. And they would constantly, you know, there's this very, very deep distrust of the German state given its history amongst the younger population. So my anarchist students were always like, oh, Stadtals find. And, you know, anti police. And we are talking about pre Black Lives Matter. I'm talking about 20 years back. And I would always remind my German students, you know what, you all have citizenship, you all have papers. So you all can critique the state because the German constitution protects your right to critique the state. And I think uh, this is the, if you all don't remember anything about this talk, you know, one hears so much uh, uh, right now, there, is, there are so many events happening. Um, 
I think one of the most important argument that I'm trying to make in this uh, talk draws on Hannah Arendt and her critique of uh, uh, universal, the declaration of universal human rights. She says it's fantastic to say that, you know, we are qua human beings. By virtue of being human, we have certain inalienable rights, a fantastic idea. However, there is no guarantee of these rights. We don't have a global state. And as long as that global state, it's a critique also of national, the idea of state sovereignty, the way the ge ge geopolitics is currently organized. But given that the world is organized the way it is, celebrating the idea, I'm not, I'm not rejecting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but I'm just pointing out that Hannah Arendt's argument that being part of a political community, having citizenship, having a state that's accountable towards you as a citizen, this right to citizenship cannot be underestimated. And I'm literally quoting our, our, an Aaron. There's nothing romantic about this idea of you know, global citizenship and statelessness because there is no, there's no addressee. There's nobody to uphold this idea of global citizenship. Um, and that, that norm is, of course, something worth holding on to, but it is in a certain way an empty promise.